thing when uh, they wanted to they wanted to put Jesus to death, and Pilate said, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with this guy, so he did he did something. What did he do? To make himself clean.
sons of Jacob have. here and able to be with us and we'll begin by singing number 105. Oh 
sing a song, Brother Ryan Neesmith will lead us in prayer. Oh, feel my Let us pray. Dear Lord, our God, Lord, we're so thankful that you've given us all the measure of health that you've given us so that way we can gather this evening and worship to hear another portion of your word, to sing songs, praises under your name, Lord. Lord, we thank you for um, giving your son to die on the cross for the remission of our sins, Lord. We're uh, thankful for all the many blessings you've given us um, to live this life with. Uh, ask that you be with uh, those that are sick, those who have lost loved ones recently, Lord, just uh, praying that you, you give them the strength they need. Uh, be with us um, over the course of the next hour, Lord. Help us to hear from your word, to learn from your words. So that way we may um, apply it throughout our everyday lives. And please forgive us of all of our sins. In Jesus' name, amen. Song of Encouragement will be number 272. Before the lesson, let's sing number two in the supplement, Higher Ground. If you'd like to, may stand while we sing this song. I'm pressing on.
We are glad that you're here this evening. Appreciate your being with us. Appreciate those that join us online. I hope you've had a happy Easter today. Uh, I'd like for us to ponder one of the great questions of life. Uh, maybe you can help me out. I am going to tell you the question. I don't know the answer. Uh, what in the world do eggs and bunny rabbits have to do with Easter? I've never figured that out, and I've lived a long time, and I've asked a lot of people. Uh, so, well, we'll move on. All right, you had time to ponder that? We'll look at something else now. Uh, this morning, Matt had a, an excellent lesson on the death of Jesus, the suffering and, of agony in the garden, and, and then actually what he went through very briefly, and then his death. Uh, and so I'd like for us to talk about after Jesus died. This is what Paul Harvey would call the rest of the story. Uh, but I'd like for us to think about what happened after Jesus died. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning there in verse 3, Paul says, I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. Now this is basically the, a, a very brief summation of the lesson this morning. Christ died for our sins. It was prophesied before Jesus told the disciples He was going to do it. They didn't understand it. The Jewish people didn't understand it. But Jesus died for our sins. And then He was buried. Now, this is not anything that's earth shattering. Normally when people die, we have a funeral and then we have a burial. In Matthew chapter 27, we read there beginning in verse 57 that it, when it was evening, and this is after Jesus was on the cross, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph who himself had also become a disciple of Jesus. And if you go over to the book of John, it says he was a secret disciple because of his being afraid of the Jews. This man went to Pilate and he asked for the body of Jesus. And Pilate ordered it to be given over to him. And Joseph took the body, wrapped it in clean linen cloth, and laid it in a new tomb. And also, if you go over to John, it tells us that Nicodemus, the one who came to Jesus that night, assisted Joseph of Arimathea in burying Jesus and putting the spices on his body and so on. He laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn out in the rock, and he rolled a large stone against the entrance and went away. And so Jesus is taken off of the cross and He is buried by Joseph and Nicodemus in this new tomb that nobody had ever been buried in before that belonged to Joseph of Arimathea. If we go back to 1 Corinthians 15, the verses there 3-4, through 4, He says that Christ died for our sins, that He was buried, and that He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. So Paul says, let me tell you the summation of the Gospel. It is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it is extremely important for us to understand, and there are many passages, as Matt pointed out this morning, that Jesus died for our sins. And He did die as the sacrificial lamb. And He did take our sins upon Himself Paul says to the Corinthians that God made Him who knew no sin to become sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. And so yes, we do understand that Jesus died for our sins. He was buried and then He was raised on the third day. There have been a lot of major religions over the history of the world, but the fact is, Every major religion in history has had a leader, somebody that started it, somebody that was the, the prominent person in it, somebody that got it going, somebody that, that was considered as the one behind this new religion. And every one of them died. Every single one of them have died. The only one that was raised from the dead is Jesus. 
You can look at all of the other religions of the world and their leader is still in the grave. But not Christianity because Jesus was raised from the dead. And out of all these leaders, only Jesus still lives. And He lives today and He'll live forevermore. So the resurrection of Jesus is proof that He is the Son of God. We need to remember this. It is the resurrection that proves that He really, beyond all the other things, that proves He's the Son of God. Paul, in writing to the Romans, as he begins to introduce himself and introduce the book, there in the first three verses of the, cha- of the chapter one of the book of Romans, he says, Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets and the Holy Scriptures. Concerning his son, that is Jesus, concerning his son who was born of a descendant of David according to the flesh. And then notice what he says. Who was declared the son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead. Now the the word that's used here for declared is is a word that means a statement is made of a fact that already exists. The resurrection didn't make Jesus the Son of God. He was already the Son of God. But the resurrection was proof that He was the Son of God. And so He was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from from the dead according to the Spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord. And so we see Jesus is the Son of God and is proven to us by his resurrection. Wrong one. So his resurrection gives us hope of eternal life. Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, and we're going to read several verses from that chapter tonight, but he, he makes quite a lengthy argument to show this very point that it is the resurrection of Jesus that gives us hope. In verses 13 and 14, Paul says if there's no resurrection of the dead, and there were a lot of people in his day just like there are today who claim that once you die, that's it, you're dead. And you don't ever, you know, that's all there is to it. And so we just like the animals, we live for a while, we die, and that's the end of it. Paul says if there's no resurrection of the dead, then not, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is vain. Your faith also is vain. So Paul says you're wasting your time claiming to be a Christian if there's no resurrection. Verse 16, he says, if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless and you're still in your sins. The fact is Jesus died for our sins. But that would be meaningless if he just died. It is the resurrection that finishes the job of his sacrifice. Verse 19 says, If we hoped in Christ in this life only, we're of all men most to be pitied. We are a pitiful lot if there is no resurrection. Because everything we're doing is a waste of time. Everything that we believe is false. He said, even, even God is, is a liar if, if there is no resurrection. And so everything that, that we believe and everything that we put our hope and our trust in is, is underpinned and based on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Peter tells us in 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 3, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We've been born again to this living hope and it's because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. To obtain an inheritance which is imperishable, undefiled, not fade away, reserved in heaven for you who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. And so he says our hope is based on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In 1 Peter 1, dropping down to verse 20, 
He says he talking about Jesus. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world. But has appeared in these last times for the sake of you who through him are believers in God. Who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. The basis of our faith and the reason for our hope is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So I don't think that we can ever overemphasize the importance of the resurrection and what it means to us today. Going back to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul says there near the end of the chapter, beginning in 54, he says, when this perishable, we're talking about this physical body, when this perishable will have put on the imperishable, that is, our spiritual body, this mortal will have put on immortality, that is, this body that dies will put on the body that doesn't die. Then will come about the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. Now what Paul is saying here is, if we are going by the law, and we violate it, then we are lost. And we die because of that. We die physically and spiritually. He says the sting of death is sin. That's what separates us from God. But he says, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, it is because Jesus has been raised from the dead that we have victory over death, we have victory over sin, we have eternal life promised to us. So just like Jesus died and was buried and then arose, we are to die to sin. And Matt pointed out this morning that we are to die to sin just like Jesus died. We're to be buried just like Jesus was buried and we're buried in baptism. We are to be raised a a new person in Jesus or in Christ. And so we die just like Jesus died. We're buried just like Jesus was buried. We're raised just like Jesus was raised or in likeness of it. Paul describes this in Romans 6, and really to get the whole thing, you need to read about half the chapter, but we'll just read a few verses here. He says, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into His death? Therefore we've been buried with Him through baptism into death. In order that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. And so he says, we're baptized into his death. We're buried with him through baptism into death. And then we're raised up to walk in newness of life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. And so he says, just like Jesus was raised, and he says death is no longer master over him. He says that, He no longer is is affected by sin. So we will be raised to. We die to sin. It's no longer master over us. But we live for God and we serve God. And we are what He wants us to be. And His blood continues to cleanse us so that we can have this promise of eternal life. And it's because of the resurrection that we have this. In Colossians 2, Paul says, beginning in verse 12, he says, Having been buried with Him, that is with Christ, in baptism, in which you were also raised up with Him through faith in the working of God, who raised Him from the dead. And when you were dead in your transgressions and uncircumcision of your flesh, He made you alive together with Him, having forgiven us all our transgressions. And so we are buried We die, we're buried, and we're raised. Just like Jesus died, and He was buried, and He is raised. We're born again. You remember when Nicodemus came to Jesus, 
And Jesus told him, he said, you need to be born again. He said, how can a man be born again? He said, I'm old. I can't enter into my mother's womb and be born a second time. And Jesus explained to him, I'm not talking about physical birth. I'm talking about a spiritual birth. We become a new person. And so we're born again into Christ. We become this new person in Jesus Christ. And we live in Him and He lives in us. In Colossians 3, beginning of verse 1, Paul says there, if you've been raised up with Christ, and he's talking about being buried with Him in baptism and raised up to walk in newness of life in the verses right preceding this, if you have been, or since you have been, it would probably be a better translation here, since you've been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on the things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. In other words, he's saying you don't live for yourself any longer. It's easy for us to get caught up in all the things of life and, and to think life is about me and it's all about what I want, it's what I like, it's what I think. But he's saying that's not the way it is when we're in Christ. We're, we're thinking about what can I do to please God? What can I do to please Christ? It's like Matt pointed out this morning when Jesus was praying, he said, not my will, but your will be done. And on one occasion, Jesus just simply said, He said, I have come to do your will, O God. That's why He came, to do the will of God. And you know, we talk a lot of times about the love of Jesus and how He died for our sins and how He loves every one of us. And I believe that that's true. I really believe that that's, that demonstrates a love that we can't even imagine. But I really believe, even more important to that, than that to Jesus. The reason that He did the will of the Father and the reason that He died on that cross and the reason He went through all of that suffering is because He loved God above everything else. And He wanted to do the will of God. And so He said, I, I, me personally, I don't want to do this. But God, if that's what you want, I'll do it. And so we need to understand that our life is to be hidden with Christ in God. We don't live for ourselves, we live for Him. Going back to 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 22, he says, Since you have an obedience to the truth, purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren. Fervently love one another from the heart. For you have been born again, not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable, that is, through the living and abiding Word of God. He says you've been born again to live for Him and to serve Him and to be what He wants you to be. But once we become a Christian, we must continue to grow spiritually. It's not just a matter of becoming a Christian and you know we get our ticket punched and then we just sit down and relax and we're going to make it to heaven. That's what it's all about. No, that's not it. That's just the beginning. It's like a person is not born into this world and then all of oh there it goes back. Not all of us all of a sudden, you know, they're not adults making good decisions. I'm amazed at, at people allowing little children to make major decisions in their lives. We we attended a congregation one time and there was a man there. Uh, and he had a son that was 12 years old, and, and his son quit coming to church. And I asked about him. He said, oh, he said, well, he, he decided he didn't want to go anymore. 12 years old. He decided he didn't want to go anymore. That kid's not old enough to make that kind of decision. And parents have responsibilities. And the fact is... We are to grow spiritually. We expect that in, in the physical world, and we are to grow spiritually. We are born into Christ. We, we're a new person. We're a baby. But we must continue to grow spiritually. In 1 Peter 2, in verses 1 through 3, he says, Therefore, putting aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisy and envy and slander, like newborn babes, 
Long for the pure milk of the word that by it you may grow in respect to salvation if you have tasted the kindness of the Lord. Just like a baby has to have milk to live for a while. He says, you just uh, want this more than anything else. You long for it so that you may grow in respect to salvation. In chapter 4, 1 Peter, in verses 1 through 5, he says, Therefore, since Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourself for the same purpose. Because he has suffered in the flesh, has ceased from sin, so as to live the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for the lust of men, but for the will of God. We don't live for our own desires. We live for the will of God. For the time already past is sufficient for you to have carried out the desire of the Gentiles, having pursued a course of sensualities, lusts, drunkenness, carousals, drinking parties, abominable idolatries. He says all these are things that you did before you became a Christian. All of these are things you did before you came to Christ. Now you get rid of all of that and now you follow the will of God. You live for Him, you serve Him, you do His will. In all this, they're surprised that you do not run with them in the same excess of dissipation, and they malign you. But they shall give an account to Him who's ready to judge the living and the dead. You see, this is the bottom line of what life is all about. This is something about life that we don't really have to Spend a whole lot of time trying to figure it out. This is what it's all about. The wise man Solomon, in writing Ecclesiastes, writes about life and the meaning of life and how to find fulfillment in life and all of that. And, and of course, Solomon being the wealthiest man that ever lived and being the most powerful man probably that has ever lived and having all of the things that he had and the wisdom that he had, he was better suited to do that and to try different things than anybody. And he tried everything that he could come up with to find the meaning of life. And at the end of the book, he says, the conclusion to the whole matter is fear God and keep His commandments. Because every man will face Him in judgment. We're going to face God in judgment. And we can either have the promise of eternal life or we can know that we're going to be lost. But it's through Jesus Christ that we can have eternal life. The question this evening is, have you been born again? Are you living for Christ? If you're not a Christian, then you need to come to Jesus and enact his death, his burial, and his resurrection by dying to sin, by being buried in baptism, and then be raised to walk a new life in Jesus Christ. If you're here this evening and you're subject to his invitation, we invite you to come as we stand and stand. <clears throat> I have
supper has been let prepared for anyone who is unable to partake this morning. If you could, raise your hand and we we'll be happy to serve you if you'd like to partake. I want to thank Brother Robert for his lesson this evening, and we want to thank you all for being here and being part of our Sunday evening service this Lord's Day. We'll meet again on Wednesday evening at 7 o'clock, and then again that Sunday morning at, uh, at 10. Where's that? I think... I've got you down, I think. Is that right? I was trying to find my notes, and I ate them or something. I don't know. Uh, if there's nothing else, Brother Joel Lynn will lead us in prayer, and then we'll be dismissed. Let's all bow. Almighty God, our great God, we thank you for this great day that you have blessed us with, for the two wonderful worship services that we've had, where we've been able to Focus our minds, Father, on the wonderful gift of Jesus that you sent to this world. Who came to this world and lived a perfect life. And he gave, gave that life on the cross of Calvary. Took our place on that cross to pay for our sins because he had us. But Father, we're thankful that you raised him from the dead. We pray, Father, that we will realize the significance of this and that each one of us may focus our lives on, on you and realize that that's where the victory comes. Death is a terrible thing. Death has come upon all of us because of sin. But thanks to Jesus and his great sacrifice, we have forgiveness of sins. And most importantly, Father, we have hope of being raised from the dead and coming home and living with you after this life is over. We pray, Father, that each one of us that every day, that it will strengthen us and guide us and help us to make it through whatever struggle we may face in this life. But we know, Father, that the eternity is far more important than anything we will even face in this life. We do pray for those among our daughter that are sick, uh, recovered from surgery, going through their treatment. We thank you for the progress that's going to be made, and we continue to pray for their full recovery.